Okay, hi everyone, it's Stephanie with The Patient's Story. I'm really excited to introduce to you today our, um, our story, our wonderful woman who does a lot of advocacy work herself, um, which is very appropriate since it is September and we've got Ovarian Cancer Awareness Month going on. So, Randa Lynn, welcome to The Patient's Story. Thank you. Really you know, excited to have you. I know you do a lot of work on your own too um, to make sure people know about um, you know, ovarian cancer and what to look out for. And I'd love to talk to you more about that um, in the story, but, but first, how are you doing today? How, how are you feeling? Good. Um, 2020 has been a crazy year for, I think the majority of um, society, but uh, as weird as it may seem, I feel like this is the year that I've actually been thriving the most, um, probably because it allowed me to stop and slow down and knock on wood. It's my first um, year since 2017, actually 2016, I had something else non-cancer related that I haven't had to have at least one surgical procedure. So um, that's a big step in the right direction. So I'm doing good today. A little tired, but that's normal. Yeah, I am so excited to hear you say that because we need to hear more of that, right? Like the 2020 has been one of these years that is like, a lot of people are like, can we just put this away and start over again or something? But the fact that you've had a great year personally, right? Um, one, without the surgery uh, involved in your year. And secondly, I love your point about slowing down, right? Because yeah. the world's been on pause and we've had to, we've been forced to slow down. Right. And so for me, since I was diagnosed in January of 2017, um, I got diagnosed, did all the surgeries, went through chemo. Um, and then I just kept going because I didn't know how else to deal with all that had happened. And I didn't want to sit and I didn't want to think about it. And one of the things my oncologist, who I'm very good friends with now, um, set, kept saying to me was, I think it's time you know, you slow down. And she kept saying, and I was like, I can't, you don't understand. I promise you I will. Mm. As soon as I can sit and be quiet mm. with all that's happened. Well, uh, here comes COVID and I don't have a choice, right? Like I had to stop and I had to, um, you know, just be, and to be honest, it really wasn't that it wasn't as awful as I thought it was going to be. And so I, I, am, I'm enjoying the slower pace and actually, feeling like I'm getting, you know, legs back underneath me. And um, it's a it's a more firm foundation, I think. So I think it's, good. it's been good. Yeah, and it's laying the foundation for the rest of your life, right? And I think I'd love to dive more into that too. Um, but since you talked about it, I mean, it's been one thing right after the other, right? And it starts with the first symptoms. And then as soon as you throw yourself into the healthcare system, it's just like, bam, 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 bam. So, and let's, let's rewind those years and go back to that time. Can you tell us again, what was it that got you thinking, okay, something's not feeling right here. And I, I need to go get this checked out. Yeah. So, um, I was 36 years old. I had an extremely stressful job. Um, I was, I am, I'm not was, I am a part-time mom of, um, single mom of two children. Um, so couple that with, you know, working 50 plus hours a week, um, having some events at the office go on. I, I was telling myself that the reason I was exhausted and fatigued, and I'm one of those that when I'm stressed out, I don't eat. So all of those things, right, were norms for me. It wasn't until, and that would have been, I'd say it, that totally took over October of 2016. Now, if I look back in photos, um, the weight loss, like significant, like, oh my gosh, there's something wrong with her. You can start seeing that in July of 2016. But, um, I would say for sure, October. And then, um, Christmas of that year, uh, I have my children every other, well, we always have them on Christmas day. And then, then they'll go to one parent's house, you know, for, from midday on Christmas until New Year's day. And so it was my year to do the transition midday. And I decided to go on a, on a trip. And I told one of my girlfriends, I was like, I am so tired. My workout routine, it must be stale. That's what it is. There can't be anything else going on. I just need to decompress. And so I started doing a completely different workout. And in doing so, the doctors think what ended up happening was the tendons that had wrapped themselves around the tumor, which was the size of a cantaloupe, 
and I only weighed 115 pounds, you couldn't see it is the really weird thing, um, started rubbing differently. And so I thought I was developing a UTI and called my nurse practitioner and said, hey, I'm going to be driving back from the house in Florida. Can you call in um, a prescription for me? I think I have a UTI. And so I did that. Um, and at that time, that was the right, like it still was, I don't, I mean, I don't get them frequently, but like, okay, that's like a normal thing. I've had them before. So maybe this is just caused from all the stress and everything else. Um, January 2nd was when I would say, um, I, ended, I went to urgent care. They did an x-ray. Um, cysts like this don't show up on x-rays. And so um, they just want to make sure nothing else was going on. I don't know what they thought may have shown up on the x-ray, but um, they switched me to Cipro, which if you're familiar with that, that's supposed to knock everything out within like 24 hours. And 24 hours later, it still hadn't worked. And um, at that point in time, it was probably me taking, I don't know, 10, 20 steps and having to bend over because the pain was so significant. Um, and it honestly felt like I was in labor and I was like, this is just not normal. So I went to the ER and that was when, um, after a few, me persuading them that what they thought it was, um, wasn't what it was. We did a pelvic CT scan, um, with dye and both masses showed up. So I did have one on my left ovary and one on my right, but my right was the main culprit and um, what would come back as having ovarian cancer. Wow. Oh my gosh. I mean, and I know you've, you've summed it up very well in like just a few minutes, but this is over weeks and months actually of feeling these things. Um, yeah, I was reading, you, you, you know, sent me some of the information and you talked about your OBGYN and in the beginning, right? So you go to urgent care and then um, a few days later, you're actually back and with doctors and they're saying, oh, it's an appendix issue. Oh, it's an STD. And you're like, wait a minute, none of this makes any sense. Right. I was like, no, that can't be. And I remember the, um, it was a male doctor that thought that it was an STD. And um, I remember, you know, like pleading with him to believe me yeah. and he didn't. And when the woman that it was a um, I, maybe an aide, we'll call her an aide, because she wasn't an x-ray technician that did the CT, but she was the one that like, tr maybe a transporter, right? She transported me from the ER to where the scan was taking place. And in doing so, she's, I was in tears because of what he had said. And in doing so, she said, you know, he's at the nurse's station right now asking them if he overstepped and why you were in tears and they're trying to explain to him you didn't believe her she we don't think she's making this up but you didn't believe her and she had said and and then the transporter herself self had said more times than not i hear the er doctors giving a diagnosis before they've actually run all of the tests right. they need to learn that they shouldn't that whatever they're assuming it is they should not lay those things out until they know for for fact that's what it is the female physician that was on call that night is the one that actually and, and they were in the middle of like switching shifts was the one that actually said I don't think that's what it is either I think she you know her appendix I think is about right rupture let's go ahead and do a pelvic CT scan and her face when they she came in to tell me you know you have these masses it still didn't click in my head like I was like okay well people get ovarian cysts this is okay, well, I guess this explains it. And I was supposed to go s snow skiing with my kids in like 10 days from then. And I was like, well, can we wait until after that? And I was, my mom's like, you're on morphine and it's not working. Like, no, we can't wait. And um, yeah, so it's interesting how things play out and how physicians yeah. and the people around them, you know, kind of are like, well, you probably should have handled that a little bit differently. Right. It's, it is one of those weird things where you, you hear about bedside manner and then like relationships, but until you're really thrust into the system where you're dealing with them over and over again, it's, it's really hard to understand the impact that they right. have. Right? Like they're trained in medical school for all the technical stuff and the medical stuff and the scientific stuff. That's great. But in dealing with people every day, there's definitely a lot uh, to be learned for some of them. And I think, <laughs> I think exactly. you one such lesson for that doctor, right? He must've been like, okay, maybe hopefully after you, he didn't do that again. 
I don't know. I, the first, so I had chemo in the same, even though I was not the hospital like where my cancer center is, but they have a floor there. Um, the gynoc department does. And so I did my chemo there. And I remember one day I had said, hey, while I'm hooked up, can you wheel me down and see if the <laughs> physician that was on call so that I can tell him that that's not what, what's wrong? And they were like, no, we cannot do that. <laughs> You wanted to just tie up the loose end. Right, I just <laughs> wanted him to know that, hey, you probably shouldn't jump to assumptions. Here's what's really wrong with me. Right. No, I love that. And I think that shows your heart, you know? I mean, I'm, we're just really meeting each other now, but I, I think that's an example of where your heart is. You're always hoping to help other people. And, you know, I think that was, I think we can hope that that was a teaching moment for him. Right, um, exactly. But, but, you know, you're talking about all these things. They, they see the masses and you describe that even then, right? Cancer doesn't, you know, pop up in your mind, but apparently it didn't really pop up in the mind of the doctors either, including your OBGYN, right? Can you describe again what happened there and what her thoughts were and then the lack of testing that happened? Right. So um, the physician on call that night in the ER, she, it was about 1.30 in the morning when she came and told me, hey, we did the ultrasound as well. You have masses didn't know she said you have a mass she didn't tell me i had to nor did she tell me how large it was um on your right ovary i need to do you have an OBGYN? and i said yeah i said actually i delivered in this hospital um she is on staff here um or at least has has rights to be in the hospital and and in the or here and so they said okay i'm gonna give her a call um, and we'll see what she wants to do. And they admitted me because the pain was, morphine wasn't managing it and they had to end up going to a dilated drip. And um, on top of that, they wanted to start a round of antibiotics. And so I was admitted and um, my OBGYN came in the next morning and she said, you, you look good. You look tired. How's the pain? And I was like, I am still in a ton of pain. And she's like, well, I, I think probably there's a little bit of an infection as well. Um, we're going to keep you on these antibiotics. I'm trying to get an OR, but um, I don't know how long that's going to be. And I ended up staying over the weekend there. In the time that I was there, I had my blood drawn at least every twice a day, Vial, and at least five vials, well, you know, twice a day. Not one time did they ever draw CA-125, which would have, which the type I have, it's not 100% foolproof, but the type that I had, it would have shown up as an elevated CA-125 level, which could have triggered in their mind, okay, we probably shouldn't just remove this. We should probably have her be with a gynecological oncologist to do the, the, the removal. Um, what it was explained to me that I had was a 12 centimeter, so about the size of a cantaloupe, dermoid cyst. And if you're familiar with that, those are the kind, I'm not grossed out by it because I had cancer, but in the beginning I was like, oh my gosh, how am I gonna tell anybody this is what I had? So it's the kind that grows um, teeth and hair and is really kind of interesting. It's super lumpy. Um, and so that wouldn't have triggered anything either. And um, so she said, you know, I ended up, I went home 24 hours before I had surgery. And she said, so long as you stay in bed, let's get you home so you can at least get some rest. And I did and came back um, the next day. So it was about a four day, four day window between when I was admitted to the ER and when we actually had surgery. And um, I said, okay, you know, that's fine. And they did a, and she wanted to try to do it without having to do more than a uh, C-section type of scar. And they were able to get it out that way. In doing so, the surgery took quite a bit longer. So in doing so, the membrane, I can't necessarily, so that my tumor had been compromised, whether or not it was compromised during surgery or whether it was compromised prior, we don't know. Um, but yeah, and, and she's considered surgery to be a success. Um, I stayed over one night because they couldn't get my blood pressure up and I was in like a tremendous amount of pain, which was probably due to the fact that they had just removed like a whole bunch of cancer and there was other stuff going on. Mm -hmm. um, and so she told me I'd have the results in 24 hours and she didn't expect for there to be any issues whatsoever. Wow. And so that, that that's... was, I had no other, you know, I was like, okay, that sounds fine. Yeah, and you're like, okay, now I get to go on my trip with my kids and everything's good. Um, right. But, but of course, well, before we go into what happens after, 
uh, which was very different, of course, than the path that was laid out. Um, the, the surgery, I know it's not really typical for people. I mean, if they're diagnosed properly, you know, right away, the surgery wouldn't have happened this way. But could right. you just summarize um, how, how long the surgery was and was there prep beforehand um, and how it felt recovering? So I didn't have any prep beforehand. Um, it was it was supposed to take like maybe 45 minutes, ended up taking closer to two hours just because of the size and the way that they wanted to try to get it out. I did also, they also had to remove um, the cyst, not my ovary on the left side. So they left it and they took my ovary and I think it was attached to the fallopian tube as well on the right side. And that was what was biopsied. Um, afterwards, yeah. it was... I don't know. I, women that have C-sections, I have a lot more respect for you because it was pretty challenging. Um, there was like, right? Like you can't, I had never had an abdominal surgery before. And so I hadn't thought about the fact that, you know, the, even though it was lower, so it's below your bikini line, um, having to try to like move and get out of bed and everything was, was challenging. I was still tired because I had cancer and I still really wasn't able to eat because I had ovarian cancer, which is one of the symptoms, like not feeling like you want to eat or feeling full quickly when you take a few bites. And so, you know, that was, I don't know. I mean, it was, I guess it was typical. I don't know. <laughs> right. Right. Well, it's hard to say. And then also, like you said, you have this surgery, but you still have the cancer. So it's like hard. You don't, can't really separate the two right. at that point. And so, okay. So talk us through what happens, like summarize the next steps to actually lead to the point where it's like, Oh, no, no, no. We're dealing with something completely different here. Right. So I left the hospital on a Friday and it was a holiday weekend. Um, I do remember that. And so I hadn't gotten the results by the end of the Friday, knew I wouldn't on Monday because it was a holiday. And I had my um, OBGYN's cell phone number. And so I texted her on Tuesday and I said, hey, just checking in. Do you have those results? Like, I just want to make sure everything's okay. And she's like, no, actually, I don't. Let me call the lab. She's like, it's kind of weird that I don't have them yet. And so Wednesday went by and nothing. And I thought, okay, I'm going to give her to Thursday because I don't want to seem like the crazy patient that's like totally nagging, right? She's got other things going on. She's told me she doesn't think it's any big deal. I don't want to do this. So Thursday I had set in my mind that I was going to call, give her until like 1.30 because that'll get her through her lunch. And then I'm going to text message her again. And she beat me to the punch um, right around lunchtime on that Thursday. She called me. My mom was actually out. I felt hungry. And I said, she said, what do you want? And I said, uh, I think I want Chick-fil-A. And she was like, okay, fine. So the call came in and I was like, hey, how's it going? You know, totally just being my normal upbeat self. And she was like, I'm good. How are you feeling? And I was like, oh, I mean, you know, I'm super tired and oh man, this kind of hurts a lot. And, and it should have, I should have recognized like the tone in her voice at that point, but I didn't. And she's like, so I know why your labs took longer to, to get back. And I wasn't expecting this. And I have spent all morning trying to figure out, do I t call you and tell you to come into the office and then you know you're sick and you had to drive or do I tell you all over the phone? And she said, I decided to tell you over the phone because I didn't want you to have to get in the car and then have to drive out here and then drive back. And um, so she said, you have ovarian cancer, it's high grade, we have to get you to a gynecological oncologist very quickly. And I told her to give me a second and I put my, put the phone down. I had prepared myself, right? Like we're a week out. Um, I had actually talked to a friend who had had several cancer diagnoses or di however you pluralize that. But, um, and she said, you know, the further that you get out, the more chances it's, it's probably not good, especially when the lab's telling her that they're still running more results. And so in my head, I knew, so a dermoid cyst has a 1% chance of being ovarian cancer. Um, being my age, 36 at the time, I had a 6.7% chance of being di diagnosed with ovarian cancer. So put those two things together and my odds were going to be really low of it happening. But I had still told myself at this point that, that it was very likely going to come back that way. And I remember I said, I just need a second. And I folded over in my bed, um, had a moment, 
sat up and took a deep breath and I said, I'm really sorry. And she said, no, no, I'm really sorry. And I said, okay, do you have, um, I want to be, I want to be seen at Siteman Cancer Center, which is our, um, our main cancer center here in St. Louis. And she said, I don't, but, um, I know, you know, somebody at this other hospital and I said, well, that's okay. I don't, I don't really want to go that route. Um, and, and I called my friend because she is, she was on the patient advisory board at this, um, at Siteman Cancer Center. And so, um, she ended up, I lucked out at the time, one of the, um, physicians that was on the board was actually a gynecological oncologist and she is now my lead oncologist. And, um, she got me in two business days later. So we asked her what to do because normal protocol is not for you to call a cancer center and say, hey, I have ovarian cancer, can you get me in? It's normally like a doctor's referral and that, and then you gotta go up this chain and it takes two weeks and in my head, I'm, and, and that's what happened. I called, they said, you know, we have an appointment in two weeks, we'll call you back. Sometimes she takes people on Monday afternoons and, um, I remember thinking, oh my gosh, I was just told I had like high grade ovarian cancer. I Googled it. It meant it grew quickly. Two more weeks in my body. What is this going to do? And I ended up, I lucked out. She opened up her schedule. I think it was probably due to my age because you don't have a lot of 36 year olds that are going to walk through your door. Um, and she saw me that Monday morning. So I went from knowing I had cancer to only having to really wait a weekend um, which most people don't. And, and then I walked in her office on that Monday afternoon and we discussed what was going on. The only issue is more times than you cannot diagnose ovarian cancer without actually doing a procedure because that's the only, like, it's normally a debulking procedure, right? Or, or you're going to do the biopsy and they can normally, I think, do it on the table and be able to tell and then have to go through the rest of the debulking procedure if it comes back that you know you do have ovarian cancer but in my case i knew i had ovarian cancer and i knew the grade level that i had what i didn't know which is the most important part was what stage i was right. and so that was what we had to figure out at this point and we yeah. had to come up with a game plan to do that and so right before you know thank you i mean you you took us through that really um nicely i mean that was a lot to fit in and you know, you did touch on two things I'd like to elaborate a little bit more on. So for one, of course, the, the most, um, I mean, sometimes for people, it's not the most shattering moment, but obviously getting the diagnosis, you said you'd prepared yourself for maybe worst case scenario. You know, one, can you sort of tell us, I mean, were you able to process the diagnosis at all then? Or like many people, it's, it's much later, right? Right. So I had two hours until my kids came home from school. And in that two hour time period, I had to find myself an oncologist get an appointment. Um, my mother was at my house at the time because I can't take care of two kids by myself post-surgery. And um, I needed, she didn't take the news so well when I told her. Um, so I needed to get someone over to the house, one of her friends to help her through this and to get her back up to normal speed before the kids came home as well. And uh, so no, I didn't really have time to process it. Um, and I'm trying to think, I can't remember if I had my kids that weekend or if I didn't, I don't, anyways, it doesn't matter. So, right. So I didn't, the only time that I really had to process it would have been at night. Right. And I can tell you, I didn't sleep very much. Um, and honestly, I still don't think you have, because like you said, once you find out that like you have cancer and you get into like the flow of things, it is, they have you going nonstop one thing after another and there's really not time to think about it i don't think the whole like processing you have cancer part happens at least it didn't for me until treatment stopped right right oh, totally. finally had time to like holy moly this is what the last six months have looked like i made it but i didn't even think about it one time more right. than you know, like what was actually, what I was actually having to go through at the time. Right. Yeah, you're trying to survive in the moment and you're like, there's only one path and it's forward. And so it's just like, let's take care of these things. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you, you brought up though. So how old were your kids at the time? Your two kids when you were diagnosed? So my son was three and my daughter was seven. My daughter knows what cancer is. Uh, she knew that my mom's dad was at the time dying from it. Um, and my son was three and didn't, 
you you can't write like mommy's sick that's all you can really you you can really grasp you don't understand what that's going to mean or anything like that and so um i did not tell them so i went through my debulking procedure um and found out what stage it was and uh i think i told them the saturday or sunday before i started chemo um just because i was going to lose my hair right like that was one of the things i wanted to find out as well and um i decided it was in my best interest to tell them to be open and honest about it um and like i said i i have an ex-husband um and i wanted to do it together and so he came over and we told them together because i wanted him to be able to hear the words that i was using so that he knew what exactly was said and that if there were any concerns that we were able to both know what those would have been and kind of talk through it. The kids' schools, um, they were both, well, one was in first grade and one was in, still in like a pre-K kind of thing. And they both did really great too on, hey, uh, so now we're, I, they had all both gone through it with um, when I got divorced, like adjusting to the change um, the schools did. And now I was needing to say, hey, I got another change that we're adding to the mix. like. I have ovarian cancer. And so um, we all worked as a team and, and, and kind of combated the whole thing. Yeah, no, I'm glad you had, it sounds like you had support around you, which is good. Um, do you have any tips for other parents on um, how to handle this? I know it can be delicate and I know it depends on the kids too, um, but maybe around your, you know, the kid's age, three and seven and and, yeah. and, and second to that also, if you could follow up with, you know, the whole thing about breaking the news just in general to people is also a very personal decision. And maybe you could run through how you decided to do that. Yeah. So for the kids side of things, um, the director of the school where my son was actually had just had a neighbor go through breast cancer and her children are around the same age and they used a book. I did not use the book with them what I did was read the book to kind of see what it, it said. There are, so there are a lot of books out there that you can get off of Amazon or, or Barnes and Noble that walk through like mommy's sick or daddy's sick and break it down in those terms. Um, that initial part went okay. I think what I couldn't prepare for was them actually seeing me go through everything. Um, and they got, they got pretty tired of mommy always being sick and not being able to, to be there. And I did, I had, my support system was great. And so they, I got to everything, even if I thought I was going to be sick while I was there, that I made sure that every child thing that there was that I showed up for it. And I think that that's really key too, um, just so that you can try to make things as normal as possible. Um, and the other thing I did with the kids was everybody wanted to help and wanted to do all of these things. And I said, let me get through, um, you know, a couple rounds and see what I'm dealing with. I don't know what I'm going to feel like, and I don't know where I need help. And what I ended up coming up with was, um, allowing for there to be meals brought in on the days that I had the kids specifically for my mother and the children. So I didn't, I didn't know if I was going to eat for the day. And I told them that, like, I was like, I don't want my mom to have to worry about feeding them and herself. If you guys could just make sure that they have food, you don't need to worry about me. Like I'm, my mom will make sure I have food. Um, and so that was super helpful. That's why now your other question was, right. how did I tell people? Right. So I only told my inner circle and my family, I think my parents probably handled the whole telling my brother thing and, and all of the grandparents and stuff. We were trying to hold off on telling my grandfather that wasn't doing well. However, he was having chemo at the same cancer center and labs the day I had to go in to do my lab work and my pre-op stuff and a CT scan. And so there was no way we, my mom had gone to everything for that with him. And there were, what was she going to say? Oh, I'm sorry, I can't do this. But then we run into each other, you know, in the lobby or something like that. And so um, that was, that was kind of, that was probably one of the first, that was the next day. So that was the first people I saw. The rest I didn't tell until I lost my hair. Um, I didn't, I didn't want it to be, I needed to again, it was different, right? So I need to go through a debulking surgery, which required I was in the hospital 
for five days following because it was it was major abdominal surgery. I needed to find out what stage I was and what my exact diagnosis was. And then I had to start chemo and what was that going to look like? And I didn't want all of the outpouring of contacts or I, I'm not saying that right. You know, I didn't want everybody contacting me at once and having to deal with all of that. And so the way I broke it was through a blog because then I could tell people what I wanted to tell them when I wanted to tell them. And they were kept up to date without having to necessarily, you know, be paid. and so that was the easiest way that I came up with and it worked great. I, it caught a ton of people um, by surprise. Um, but I don't necessarily know that it was for everybody to know in the beginning. But the one thing I'll tell everybody, it's, it's your turn to be selfish. Like I, I, I wasn't a selfish person and, and this was my time to focus on what I needed to do for myself and for my kids to get both of us through this. Right. No, I love that. And you know, you kind of mentioned this too. It's part of sort of the self-advocacy. I mean, you can say selfish, which has a negative connotation, but it's not in the situation. Right. It's I don't think it has to necessarily be be a negative no, thing. No, not at all. I, I do. One of my friends likes to use the term self focused, just because ah, it doesn't have that. that connotation. But yeah. it's a thing, right? It's like, look, Randa Lynn's just been diagnosed with, you know, high grade ovarian cancer. She's allowed to decide who to tell, when to tell, all these things. But you exactly. also you had also mentioned as a patient with your OBGYN, like, you know, oh, I gave her till one thirty Thursday. I didn't want to you know, I didn't want to be that patient. And I think it's a very important point that we can't get across enough about it's okay to fight for yourself, right? Right. And my perspective on it changed after that. <laughs> so now I'm very like, hey, what's going on? And um, my oncologist, at my lead oncologist, and I say that because I have another team, um, for something else, but uh, the, my lead oncologist, uh, she she knows how I am. And so as soon as anything, even when I go through my checkups now, um, she gets the alert. She either pushes it straight through to my chart because now she knows I have my chart. Um, I did not, during all that was going on, I did not wanna know all of that. And so I didn't sign up for, to have like all of my records and everything being sent straight to me. I didn't sign up for that probably until 18 months ago, which is kind of backwards, I think. But um, so she either releases it right away or she text messages me and says, you know, here's what's going on. Everything looks really good, yada, yada, yada. And so I think that's, that's like an important thing too, right? Like if you're having a, you know, a medical team and your lead person should be able to kind of try to figure out, you know, what, is the best way for you to receive news and how you um, prefer to have it delivered. And a lot of people don't like to do it until they're in person. And me, I'm, let's just go ahead and rip the bandaid off. I want you to tell me now, and then we can discuss it whenever I come in. I'm still right. have my appointment, but let's kind of talk through this now since you have the information. Right, right. I mean, I think to your point, it's good to figure out what is your style, what would make you feel better, and then just figure out a plan accordingly. Um, and, and so you've been talking about your lead oncologist. This is uh, the woman you met with that Monday, right? Uh, who got you in pretty quickly. So describe what happened. What happened at that meeting with her? I know finally they checked the CA-125, right? Right. So uh, she walked in and uh, she does not introduce herself by doctor. Her name's Andrea. She walked in the door and she said, hi, my name is Andrea. I am so sorry that we're having to meet under these circumstances and gave me a hug. Um, and that right there speaks volumes for who she is as a person. This is how she treats everybody. She's never introduced herself as Dr. Hegeman is her last name to any of my friends or family. Um, it's always Andrea. And if you ask any of her other patients, it's the same. So, she, so I think in doing that, she tries to put herself at the same level of us, right? Like, like she's not, um, trying to elevate where she is. It's, it's a loving, it's a level. She wants to be at your level. Um, and what we did was she spent two hours with me that day. I went back by myself. Um, it was something I wanted to do by myself and walked through, you know, what this looked like, what, you know, next steps were going to be, what that surgery was going to look like and what our hopes were. And our hopes were that, um, from what the, um, I'm trying to think, 
what the um, biopsy report had shown, pathology report had shown was that um, it looked to be that it was just going to be, you know, the one ovary, the fallopian tube was clear um, and the ovary on the other side was clear along with, um, you know, it was left. And from what they could tell on the um, cyst that they removed, there was no cancer on that side. And um, she walked through all that. She listened. I cried. And then she said, so you have parents here? And I said, yes, they're in the waiting room. And she said, how do you want to do this next part? And I said, I need for you to talk to them. And I will sit there. And if you can explain to them what you just did to me, that would be great. And she, um, she took her time and explained everything. She let them ask questions um, because of course they had a lot, right? It's a lot for whomever's going to be your caretaker to take in. Um, and being, although I was 36 years old, I am, I was, am still single at the time. And um, I think my dad, you know, it, it, the dad role takes over, right? And I have to take care of her because she's my daughter. And so I need to be fully involved in, in what is going on. And I could tell that he had done his research and was asking the questions like, well, why not a robotic surgery, right? Because there are those that do robotics. And there, there are reasons behind why you don't and why you do um, a regular open procedure. And so we learned all about all of that. And the game plan was, um, I got in uh, four days later, I was having surgery. So it was, it was, like we said, very quickly moving, and that was how that went. But it, it was great. Um, our relationship started then, and uh, we still have a very strong relationship now. Yeah, no, I'm glad because not everyone gets that, you know, in their first uh, oncologist. So I'm really happy you had that support at home, at the office, you know, um, with, the, with the oncologist. Um, I, I, you know, don't need to get into the medical jargon at all, but when you're talking about just overall deciding, okay, yeah, let's go with this debulking and the more traditional route versus say like the robotic. I mean, in deciding these things, how did you come to that um, decision, you know? So my goal was no matter what, I needed to stay alive for my children. And so the difference between, I'll, I'll make this really quickly. So my tumor had ruptured and in doing so, it meant that it had um, potentially, we still don't know, right? Cause you can't see it, but microscopic pieces were probably floating around in my ab abdominal fluid, which means it could have attached to different organs. Um, and that comes into play. So I had a full hysterectomy, including cervix and, um, in a debulking procedure for ovarian cancer, they are, so I have a, about a 13 inch incision. Um, my stomach wall was, they, they checked to make sure nothing was there. They check on all the other organs and then they actually um, take out your in, intestines and or your colon, whatever you wanna call it. And they go through that piece by piece because uh, a lot of what's in there is gonna be granular and the only way to really find it is to is, is by touch, right? And in using the robotic procedure, you're not able to do that thorough of a, um, of a check. So my omentum's gone as well. They now consider that an organ, it's a filter. Um, it catches everything and usually that is the next place it goes once it ruptures. And I lucked out and I did not have it there either. Um, what we would find out having my uterus and everything removed was I did have a focus group of endometrial cancer as well. And so, um, I mean, that would have been done, whether you would have had it done, you know, the hysterectomy laparoscopically or robotically. So that was, and, and she knew that my, my goal was whatever I have to do to be here the longest, that was what we needed to do. And if that meant that maybe the measures were a little bit more extreme than me backing off and taking a lighter approach, then that was what I was going to do. But yeah. not knowing what stage it was and knowing that the tumor had ruptured, we really didn't have another option than a full, than a full open procedure. Gotcha. Because it'd be incredibly thorough and you'd have the opportunity or she would have the opportunity to go in and, and do everything. Okay. Right. Um, thank you for explaining that. Um, yeah. So I know you were in the surgery really quickly after. Can you describe the, if there was prep leading up to it, um, what that was, and then heading into surgery, how you were sort of processing it before we talk about recovery? Sure. So the surgery, other than having, I had scans to make sure that nothing else lit up. That was going to be obvious, right? So that they could, they could try to X that out, right? So 
did that, did my blood work, um, did the whole don't eat after X, Y, Z time. Um, they had me drink a bottle of Gatorade to try to hydrate a couple hours before. Um, and I did that with, I'm trying to think like at least two, maybe three of the procedures I've had. And, um, and then I went in, but one thing that I would recommend. So I have extremely low blood pressure. Um, so I told the, so I was going through the pre-op and they were they, you know, they're going to do all of this. And for a, uh, the procedure I have, they normally do an epidural. So you have a block and you can't feel the significant amount of pain I was in. And I said something in the, the, uh, nurse anesthetist said, is there anything that we need to know about you? And I said, yes, please don't worry. When I come out of surgery, I'm going to be like 80, 85 or 55. And she said, I'm sorry, your blood pressure is going to be what? So due to the fact that was an important thing to tell them because um, an epidural actually lowers your blood pressure significantly more. And in telling them that I was not able to have the epidural and they went a different route that they normally do not for um, this. They actually put catheter um, pain bulbs in my abdomen. Um, they were in bags. They had, they just refilled them and stuff while I was at the hospital. But I think it's, the, you need to continually talk about like things like that. I think a lot of times people do not. And so, um, that was key. Uh, we went through everything just like normal. I was one of the, I was the first patient up and, um, a pre-op room at first thing in the morning is very hustle bustle right before it starts. And so, you know, they give you your laughing, ha ha, whatever, knock you out. And, um, off we go. I didn't have any nerves at all. Um, I don't think, because to be honest, I wanted it out at that point. Like, you know, you have cancer. I just wanted it out. I didn't care how you got it out. I wanted it out. And I wanted to know what stage I was, because that is extremely important in ovarian cancer. The later the stage, the lower the chances are of, um, you know, being able to go into full, no evidence of a disease. Um, and the lower, the better chance I had at fighting this and being here the longest. And so that was, I was just like, let's do this so that I can get this done. Which I understand. I mean, it was like business, let's get this taken care of and figure out the stage and then you could figure out the rest of it. Right. So, right. um, so how long was the surgery? And when you woke up, I know it said you stayed in the hospital for five days or so, um, yeah. if you could describe that recovery and then of course, learning about the stage and what they'd found. Sure. So it was five to six hours. Um, it was a pretty big deal. And um, I think I woke up in a recovery room and maybe saw my parents. I don't really remember anything until I got up to the um, floor that I was on, which was the gynecological oncology floor, I think at the time. I was the youngest person on the floor. Um, it was pretty empty while I was there. And I remember coming around the corner um, in the nurse's station and I was kind of like elevated up, you know, in the gurney and they, the nurses, I remember them saying, is that her? There's no way she doesn't look sick and she's so young. And I think that's what a lot of people's reactions are, but, and they probably didn't think that I would hear them and or remember. And I did. Um, I shared a room with an older woman who was going through ovarian cancer. Um, and the thing that I will tell you about all the older women that are going through this, and she, and she said to my parents several times, you know, like, I'm so sorry, this isn't fair to her. She shouldn't be going through this. And they're not just like, we're, the doctors aren't used to seeing someone of a younger age. The women that have been diagnosed and are either recovering from surgery or going through chemo aren't used to seeing you either. And they don't like it because they know you know, the, the road you're going to have ahead of you. Um, I would say the recovery from the full debulking procedure was significantly easier um, pain-wise than the first surgery. Um, it could have just been the post care that I had, you know, the stuff that they sent me home with and everything like that. I did go on blood thinners for hmm, at least two weeks. It could have been three. Um, very hard to get in up and down. I would say your best option is a recliner. That's what I had. Cause I was able to at least like push myself up to the stage to where, you know, I could at least put my arms out and, and like not try to help and just have somebody pull me up. Um, and then two weeks later I would find out 
um, what my staging was and went back. And, and this time I did the same as I did the first time. I wanted to go back by myself. And the resident came in first. And I remember I totally broke down and I was like, how bad is it? And um, she was like, it's, 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 I can't give you that everything, you know, it's going to be fine. We're going to need to do chemo, yada, yada, yada. And I was, and, and so then Andrea came in and she said, so we got the news that we wanted. It's one C. However, and I'm like, what is this? However, like, why do I keep having this? However, and she's, however, you threw us for a loop. You also have a focus group of endometrial cancer, which we did not see coming. Mm -hmm. So instead of having four rounds of chemo, you're going to definitely need to have the six mm -hmm. um, to kind of combat that. She said, and I'm going to have to have you do genetic testing because I need to make sure that you don't have Lynch syndrome, mm -hmm. um, which would, which is pretty um, common for somebody with Lynch syndrome to ho have both at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, let's just hit the ground running. And so we went through the drugs I would be on, which was uh, carboplatinum and Taxol. Um, and um, I would receive one treatment every three weeks of both my, my treatments. She mapped it all out. It, was, it took about six to seven hours, depending on how I could drip. And um, I met my nurses. And, uh, I, th I think she explained to my parents again, I think I said, can you just tell my parents, I can't, I can't do this right now. If you could do that, that would be great. And so I think they came back and she explained everything again and had my port placement done. And, um, then the following week I would start. So three weeks post-surgery, I started chemo. Wow. Again, it's just like, again, it's just one thing. It's like, okay, surgery, big one. We'll let you recover, but we're heading right into chemo right after, right? When it's, yeah. it's humanly possible to get that. So um, before we dive into the chemo, um, the uh, surgery, so the recovery after the hospital, I mean, was it like, oh, I have to prove I can pee before I go home? And was there any of that? Before oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I didn't have, oh, wait, I did have a catheter maybe. So I had to be able to, I didn't want to walk. That was the hardest part, right? Was the whole walking and the sitting in a chair. Sitting in a chair with abdominal surgery is the worst. So one, they usually want you to have a bowel movement. I'm not sure I did while I was there. Um, I had to get my blood pressure at least up to 90 and that took me a little while. And I did, I was able to go to the bathroom. Like they pulled that catheter out. I lucked out. They pulled the catheter out within like 24 hours of surgery. But the only reason they were able to do so was because I didn't have the epidural and I had the pain bulbs. Otherwise, I think they leave that block in for a few days, which kind of slows things up a little bit. Um, but I was up walking around maybe within 36 hours. Um, and you know, you start slow and then you eventually, you eventually get faster. So yeah, I don't remember having a bowel movement and that's usually like the number one thing that they'll make you do right. before you, but I think it's due to the fact that everything was kind of taken out, gone through and then put back in, it yep. takes a little bit longer. Yeah, and but and very importantly, talking about moving around, I know they that they stress that. So in the beginning, it's really hard to actually want to get up, but once you do, it, it starts to feel better, right? Right. Okay. <laughs> you get, you get, every, your body gets moving, and so yeah. it's 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 better. Um, so then you can recover it at home, and then you were able to get your port placed. Any notes about port surgery? I mean, I know it's a minor one. Uh, people, of course, are going to get a little freaked out because it's a foreign object, you know, getting put into you. Um, it hurts like you wouldn't believe and nobody prepares you for it. I was super thin though too. And so I don't know if that's not part of the problem. Like I was pure, I think by surgery, I was down to 105. Um, and I'm five, six to give you an idea. I'm not, I'm not a little person. Um, and so they didn't have a lot of like skin and stuff to get it under. And there was a lot of poking and a lot of whatever. And um, I remember thinking that if there, if I was to, ever know what it might feel like to be in a bar fight i think this is probably what it is because you just oh you can't even move mm -hmm. and it took like five days for that like pain to go away and i've told several people that they've been like they do not prepare you for how uncomfortable you feel after that and i was like i know i think it like i don't know maybe it was because i was still recovering from surgery that i was like this yeah. is brutal but um yeah, yeah there's not a lot of, and they put the, what, I, I didn't understand like the whole port thing, right? You have the one, I had a power port. Right. So that meant that you could draw labs out of it. I could get chemo out of it, everything like that. And so it was this little purple thing that went up and then it connected here in my, into your 
and do a vein in your in your neck that bypasses your your heart because you don't want to go the chemo to go into your heart. But I didn't realize that like that was like up here. And so for the longest time, I felt like I couldn't go like that because I was always afraid that I would like the move right. it out of the way. But that won't really happen. I mean, right. the chances of that happening are slim to none. So yeah. it's just getting used to having this little one object, one <laughs> object with you and having to move around with it. Right, right. No, and and you know, to your point, I think it is a very um, individual experience. I do think maybe the weight had to do with it. Just I, I had a double port put in for for me, and yeah. I remember it being uncomfortable as well. I don't remember it being very painful getting put in. I do remember it was odd. So I think people can yeah. just expect because you're not completely under um, no. for most people for the for the procedure. So um, I think it's great just to hope for the best, expect the worst for a lot of these things. Anyway. Exactly. Right. So, so thanks for sharing that. So, okay, you had to recover from the port. It had to, you know, it's like this weird thing. And then you did start your chemo. So it was six rounds, once every three weeks. Um, mm -hmm. it, was, it was carboplatin and taxol, and you had six to seven hours. But people also don't realize, I mean, when you go there, you have to get labs done beforehand. You have to wait. So I lucked out, and I got to have all of my labs on Friday before, because I was on a Monday. So I did at least have to nix that part out. Um, but I did have a pre, like a pre bag that had the anti nausea and some steroids and stuff in it. And so that adds a little bit of time. So, how did you, any tips for people in terms of, um, we'll talk about side effects in just a second, but for the actual infusion part, um, you were in, you were basically going to the clinic or to the center, right? Mm -hmm. You got it all done there. You didn't have to take anything home, right? And then I did not. No, okay. But so, so yeah, describe to people, I guess, if that's what they're going to go through, um, sort of what that was like for you and what helped you through the infusions. Sure. So I am not normal, again, when it comes to the chemo side of things. And uh, when we get through like how I reacted to everything, I'll, I'll go more in depth with that. But I slept the entire time from the second it started dripping until... One so 8 a.m. until about 1 30 p.m. I, I slept the majority of the time. I might be up for just a little bit. Um, there's a lot of moving around. The nurses do. I had two nurses. There were, I was at a um, eight or nine chair, um, and it was only gynoc. So I did luck out there. It was all of us had some kind of gynecological cancer, and we all had the same two nurses, and it was like an open square um, with a couple seats in the middle. Uh, my family, oh, my mom and my dad, and, and usually a friend or two would always come. I think they entertained themselves because like I said, I was sleeping, but I was prepared. Like I made sure I had, again, my one friend, she was amazing. She um, gave me all the tips and tricks and I probably looked like a bag lady because on the good, on the, on the off chance that I was going to feel good, I wanted to make sure I had things to do. So I had an iPad and I had my computer and books and all these other things that they tell you to do, but I didn't use one of them and um, brought snacks and <laughs> didn't need any of them. But um, I did line my chemo chair with a blanket and then I had another blanket to put on top of me because it is cold in those, and I wanted to be as comfortable as I could be. And they always, they, the nurses always laughed and thought it was so funny because I would just like walk in and get everything situated and then I'd go to my doctor's appointment and then I'd go and, and do my chemo. And, uh, I don't know. It was, it was, I passed the time by sleeping. That's all I can say. I know a lot of people will color um, or do crossword puzzles. And like I said, that kind of thing. I always made sure I had, um, I did drink a bottle of Gatorade while I was there for electrolytes um, and water tasted awful to me. So I couldn't do that. But yeah, yeah take things to entertain yourself. My dad, he went through chemo too, like right after I did. And I don't think he slept. But he just, we, he had friends that would come in and out. And so he just talked a lot while he was doing it. That but, kept him, because he's not really a reader or anything like that. And so he just had people come that would visit with him and we'd take turns. And I, I love that. I mean, I think your dad, you and your dad exemplify how people are just really different and how they want to pass the time, right? Yep. So, so, I mean, infusions usually go, you know, pretty much without a hitch. They're pretty smooth, especially because you're under the care of these professionals. But can you describe when the side effects would hit um, and what they were? What were the what were the worst ones for you? And um, yeah. So day one, I went into anaphylactic shock. <laughs> I was allergic to uh, Taxol, um, and I 
so you normally have an allergic reaction between like before the 13 minute mark, maybe before the 10 minute mark. I was at the 15 minute mark and it came on, I got hot and I was telling my mom, something isn't right here. And I tried to cough and I was like, I couldn't breathe. And so, um, on my first day, I thought that I was not going to be able to receive this drug. And now what do I do? Because this was my only chance of living and things like that. That's not what happens. They ended up giving me, um, you know, plenty of things to reverse the side effects. I then got, um, you know, some fluids and whatnot. And then they started it all over again, very slowly. A lot of it has to do with the speed at which you drip too. And so, um, I was a very slow dripper since I got um, sick to it. Now, the weird thing is, is with Taxol, the longer you take it, the less reaction you have to it. With Carboplatin, the longer you take it, the more chance you will have an allergic reaction to it. And so they were really worried that I was going to, towards the end of the rounds, start having a reaction to Carboplatinum, but I didn't, I lucked out. Um, they also say that you're going to get this steroid high after your chemo when they give you the steroids to take. I never got it. As soon as my um, chemo started dripping, I got extremely sick. So I was in bed, nauseous um, and whatever, for at least five days straight. Uh, ended up back in the hospital after my fourth round for, to get a bag of fluids. That was the worst I'd ever been. And um, it was the only time I was wheeled in and out of the hospital other than for my debulking surgery. Um, outside of that, once I got through the, the five days afterwards, it was a lot of nausea until I got into the last week before I would, last five days before I headed back into chemo. And I felt pretty decent on those days. Okay. Nausea is extremely hard to explain um and the fatigue and uh had a very heavy metal taste which is common with the type of um chemo i was given okay. so yeah okay so heavy on the nausea and the fatigue um outside of the fluids they had to give you when you went to the hospital did anything else help i guess anti-nausea medic medication drinking a lot of liquids to flush out i mean any of those things so i tried all of that and they had told me that they wanted me drinking about um a hundred ounces of water a day, the first couple of days afterwards. And I choked that down. But the only way that I really got through the nausea part was I slept. And so the, I had two different anti-nausea medications and now I can't remember what the stronger one was, but anyways, it was the, and I was able to somehow kind of piggyback them. So I knew Zofran wasn't going to work because they tried to give it to me when I was pregnant because whenever I had both my children, I had nausea so bad. And I kept telling them, this isn't going to work. And they were like, sure, it will. And I was like, mm, it's not going to work. It didn't work when I was pregnant. And I don't think it's going to work now. And they were like, well, it's really made for this, not pregnancy. And I was like, okay. But it didn't. But you could, I could time it to where if I took one, then I could take another and still before I was able to take the really strong one again, I would be able to take, you know, the Zofran and everything. And doing that and coming up with a pattern to be able to kind of stagger it out was best. Don't wait until you get sick. They tell you you're gonna get sick. Yep. So just go ahead and start taking the anti-nausea pills because once you're to that point, there's no coming back. Like, it just doesn't work. Did you find that? Absolutely, I did. And they, they tell you, and I've, I've talked to a lot of other people and they say the same thing, right? It's like, you have to stay ahead. Because yeah. what, right, right, what you just said, once the nausea hits, sorry, it's, it's too late, you know? That's it. it. Yeah. Yeah, and I got, so I was in menopause at a two, right? Like surgically induced menopause. And I remember that was, I couldn't, the, the night sweats and from the chemo and the menopause and, and just everything was just so much afterward. It was just, amplified so much. Yeah, I, I was put into the, you know, the temporary menopause. Um, and I remember the hot flashes and stuff. And so okay. I do want to ask you because this comes up as, of course, the side effect that people dread so much, the hair loss, right? And, and um, it's the thing about looking sick and, and there's so much and there's the thing about control and losing it. Um, so I'd like to ask, you know, when did you start to feel the hair was falling and how you were able to make the decision of whether you were going to shave it all off? And, and I love how you described actually what you did. So uh, if you could talk about that. So, right. I forget that that's a side effect. Like, I'm just like, mm, well, okay. So uh, they told me between, by the time I came back from my 
second round of chemo, all of my hair would be gone. I anticipate that it started falling out two weeks later or, or that it would be gone two weeks later. And so this, so 12 days after my first round, I had decided I was going to do, it wasn't my choice how I, that I got cancer, but how I was going to go about doing everything that I had an option in. I was going to make sure that I was fully, this was my choice. This is how it's going to go. You can tell me that I have to do this and you can tell me that I can have to do this, but on the things that are my choice, I'm going to own them and make them my own. And so I knew that me going from having hair to having none at all was going to be really difficult for the kids. And in my mind, what could I do? And so I had a party, I had a head shaving party and um, my two kids and um, my friend's daughter, who I call my niece, um, she's she was younger. She might have been, well, if Jackson was three, she was maybe one and a half. And um, they shaved my head. And, the, and Olivia got the first swipe out at it, my daughter. Um, and one of my girlfriends helped her. And then, um, but the funny thing was, like, I was trying to do everything to not, like, have a nervous breakdown during all of this, too, right? So, like, my my son just kept and there's a video my son just kept saying mom 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 and i was like what and i felt so i was like looking at the video i was like geez you're mom of the year right there and um he's like it's black and i was like what are you talking about like literally said it just like that again what use your words randall and you always tell your kids like let's be nice <laughs> so my hair was blonde but I had dyed it blonde and he had, you know, with highlights and everything. And he had never seen me with dark hair. So when they went and took the first swipe and it was like pure, pure, like black. Um, it's not, I have dark brown hair, but to him it looked black. Um, it, it was, it, it lightened the mood, right? Like I laughed and everything like that. So they did pretty good um, with all of that. And then my, uh, one of my girlfriends went into my bathroom with me after, with me afterwards and we took it down significantly to where it was it was just stubble she's like we should probably clean this up and get it a lot shorter it's gonna fall out and it's gonna be everywhere and um one of my other girl girlfriends had stayed the night with me that night because the kids weren't there they ended up going back to their dads after we did the whole um head shaming thing and so she ended up staying the night and the next morning i woke up screaming cam cam and i was in the shower and she was like used to uh, somebody always sat in my bedroom because i was well i don't think she was in there at that time but the first three weeks like somebody always sat in my bedroom if i was in the shower you know in case i needed help um due to the surgery and everything and she came running in and she was like what's wrong and i was like it's all gone and she was like what and all of my hair like all my body hair, including the hair on top of my head, decided to fall out literally the day after I shaved it. And so I lucked out and like totally took control of it and everything like that. So all I was left with at that point in time was my eyelashes and my eyebrows and maybe just a couple strands, but I used a towel to go around and try to get the rest of it to come off because it, for some reason, and you, you, my dad lost his hair with it. He had Don Hodgkins, but I don't know if you guys had the same drugs. He lost his hair. So I don't know if you lost yours. Oh, I did, yeah. yeah. Did you find that your hair was so sensitive? Like when it fell out and hurt? You know, I, I, I vaguely remember that. I, my friend who also had Don Hodgkins, she talks about it in a video too, um, where it's like, they don't tell you, but it actually like pins and needles. Yeah. And it was this main front part here hurt the worst. And it was just it was awful. Like, I don't know how to, it was, it was not awful. It was very unexpected and not something that you would think of, right? Cause your hair is supposed to kind of be dead anyways. You, you don't think that there'd be any, any feeling in your scalp and that wasn't the case. So that kind of threw me for a loop. But like I said, I, I now after round four is when I, my eyelashes and my eyebrows came very far and few between. Yes. Yes, I remember that too. I lost all of it and it looked like that was the moment where I was like, I'm an alien. Like that, it, it's right? horrible, like you, you do not realize how, like still when I had my eyebrows, but not my eyelashes, it still looked kind of okay. You know what I mean? Like, but yeah. when the eyebrows go, like you have no idea how important they are until oh, they're not there. Exactly. And it's like, oh my gosh, who, what is this? Right. And I, the worst part for me was I kept them thinly until after my last round and they had warned me they were like three weeks after your last round like 
you're gonna is when you're gonna look your worst and I was like why like mm. I just want to be done <laughs> I, know, I know it's like one thing after another right it just does yeah. not help. um but it's great that you're bringing this bringing this up because people I think forget that it's not just hair here it's hair everywhere everywhere <laughs> no um, it's, like, it's which the arm which like not having to shave was like the best thing ever but then it <laughs> It was like the first hairs to grow back. And I'm like, what? Like, why can't my hair grow as fast as the hair underneath my arms and on my legs? No, I know. They work, it's conspiring against us, honestly. It's yeah. all. No. Um, but do you have any, before we, we uh, talk about wrapping up your treatment, do you have any tips on um, dealing with the hair? And did you wear wigs and, you know, what your decision was on that? So I got a wig because I thought I was going to wear a wig because, um, I did not know what I was going to look like without hair, right? Like I had no idea like what my head looked like. Um, well, none of us do. And um, so I had, got, I had gotten a wig, bef I think I got the wig even before I started treatment. It was one of the things I did before I started, so I didn't have to worry about it in case I was super sick. Yeah. And so um, loved it, it was beautiful, it was long, it was totally different. Um, I still have it, I wore it twice, maybe three times. Um, Olivia wanted me to have a wig. And this is important on the kid thing. So she, I, the first thing I wore it to was, uh, she had a poetry night at school in second grade, they, or first grade, they always have this, they put on like a poetry cafe night and that's like the big thing. And so she wanted me to wear it. And so I was like, oh, okay, yeah, 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 I'll wear it, no problem. Well, it's so hot in general, right? And, and being in menopause, all you wanna do is rip the thing off and throw it to the side somewhere. And so I wore it there. And then maybe within a week or two after we were leaving to go on spring break and we were going to be on an airplane and we were going down to Florida to the house. And I said, Liv, I'm not, I know that you really want mommy to wear her wig, but I'm not going to because it's going to get a lot of germs on the airplane and I'm not going to wear it in Florida, Liv, it's too hot. And she was, and she started crying and I asked her why she was crying and she said, um, because people are going to make fun of you. I see the way they look at you. And I said, Oh, I said, Olivia, do you think that people don't know that I'm sick? I said, because, because Olivia, they all know the reason that I don't have hair and mommy has this port here and mine stuck out like a sore thumb. And so Liv, they know I'm sick and they're not going to make fun of me because they can they, they know I have cancer. And she was like, but you didn't tell them. And I was like, but for you now, Liv, whenever you see people like this, you'll know that there are more, than, more chances than not that they are probably undergoing cancer treatment or some form of treatment that has caused them to lose hair. It had never registered in my mind that she would be more concerned about the fact, and she did not want my feelings to be hurt. And so she was afraid people would make fun of me and hadn't realized that the reason that they were probably looking at me was because of my age, right? And um, why at such a young age had, did she not have her hair? But it had not, I had got it because I wanted them to be more comfortable if we were in a setting or something. I did not realize that it was going to be, she was asking me to wear it so that it was helping me. Yeah, it's fascinating. And, right. and such a pure, like children are just so pure, I feel like. Yeah. Um, and the funny thing was, and so her friends saw me with a wig and without a wig. The girls said nothing. The boys were the most intrigued with the whole thing. It was hysterical. Like, so Jackson was in pre-K something or other at the time. And the, the little boys in his class, they just didn't know what to do. And so I would, you know, like let them, you know, like lean over so they could like feel it. And I was like, it's okay. You can feel it. Like I'm, I'm still the same person. And it was hard for them. Right. Like I didn't look like I was the same person. And when you're three years old, you can't figure out what's going on. This woman is speaking and it sounds exactly like Jackson's mom, but it's not Jackson's mom the way that they see Jackson's mom. And so, uh, I would wear it different places and, and they all got used to me having it or not having it. And, and the kids at Olivia's school, like I remember I wore it on a field trip, but it got hot that day and I was hot flash city. And so I had it off and just a hat on by the end of the day. And one of the girls was walking by and said, well, where'd your hair go? And the other little girl, my, Olivia wasn't around, said, she has cancer, okay? She doesn't have hair. That was her wig. And I was just like, oh my gosh. 
I don't know what these kids go home and tell their parents, but they're probably like, way to go, Ringolin, like teaching our kids one more thing. But it was, it was, I don't, so I didn't wear my wig. I wore it to a friend's wedding because that was her day. And I did not want for um, my bald head mm-hmm. sitting in the, you know, in at the reception or, or during the ceremony right. to take away from her day. And so I wore it there. Like I was pretty cognizant of those kind of things because it, it is, even though you don't think people are, are looking, you know, it, it's distracting and I didn't want to take away from, oh, what's wrong with you kind of a thing when it was her day. Her day. No, I, I hear you. And I think what's fascinating, fascinating about all this is just, you don't know until you actually live in the world and, and live day to day with the wig, without the wig and the, with, the, with the kids. Right. So funny. Um, so thank you for taking us through that because again, it's, it's just one of those things where People hear, hear and talk about the top line stuff, but these right. details, right, you don't really figure out. Um, but, but so you were able to get through um, the chemotherapy, right? And you finished six rounds. So was there a scan in the middle and then one at the end? Like how did they figure out how your progress was? No, so for, um, I'm gonna say this is for all, over, all stages of ovarian, I don't think that they do another scan until after you've finished what is considered your first um, first regimen, right? And so I got done with that. And I remember leaving my sixth round of chemo and I had to have um, new Lasta. And um, I didn't think I was gonna have, I hated it, it was awful. But I didn't think I was going to have to have it after my sixth round, right? Like. I'm not, I'm not doing this again, like no big deal. And I remember we went through, you know, the end of the chemo treatment, just like we did. And they put it on. And I said, I don't really like, let's not do it. I don't have to do this again. It doesn't matter what my white blood cell count is. It'll eventually come up. And my nurse said to me, that's what we're hoping for. But I have to prepare you that if your scans don't come back, right, like we'll have to do a few more rounds. And that thought had never crossed my mind, right? Like, I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I did not, like, what? It's just not something you prepare for. So I have scanned afterwards. And um, and on July 3rd was when I would get my res- results. So I went from Ju- or June 5th, which was Jackson's fourth birthday, was my last round of chemo. And then July 3rd, I went, I, I extended it. To, to like a month period because I wanted to go on a little trip. And so they let me do that since I was done. And um, then came back, did my scans, did all my labs, and then went in and um, found out that I had no evidence of disease. And we were able to move on to the three month mark. Uh, or every three months I had to, at that point in time for the first two years, I had to do uh, just blood draws and we would do scans as needed. Um, and in that first, between July and October, I had to have two. Um, and everyone always talks about how, you know, you are you have anxiety around all of this. And so, you know, be prepared for the, your mind to kind of play tricks on you. And I went into that appointment on July 3rd and I had, a, I had the resident that I had all the time and um, she was doing her rotation and she came in and I said, listen, I'm going to tell you this. And I'm also going to preface it with, I think this is all in my head. I said, so know that I'm aware that I'm probably like making this up, but I think there is a lump or something is causing me to have to go to the bathroom frequently. And I feel a bump right where the tumor was. I think it's all in my head. So she didn't, she felt around. She was like, let me go get the doctor. I'll be right back. Well, it ends up, I did have a bump, but it wasn't cancer and it had shown up on the scan. So what I had was a lymphocyte, lymphocele, I think is what they call it. And so it was a pocket of lymphatic fluid that was actually filling up where the, um, the tumor would have been kind of, sort of, and it was pushing down on my bladder because, and, and, you know, mimicking the same symptoms that I would have had. Usually they don't bring it up that it shows up in a scan, right? Because most of the time people don't have any reaction to it. And and unfortunately I did. So I had to, I I got a drain for it and everything and um, was able to take care of it that way. But I say this because even if you think that you're making something up in your head Mm -hmm. and that you're, 
just acknowledge that, you know, you're probably really nervous and that's why you're feeling these things because sometimes it really could be something like, don't downplay what you're going through. Like, right. right. Let it's, them know yeah. it's, it's normal for all of us to kind of feel something, yeah. but go ahead and, and say it in case it really is something. And, and right. like in my case, it was. So and, thankfully yeah, I had said sure. that. Right. I mean, I think the self-advocacy note that, you know, you're really stressing and you've, you've talked about this several times. And I think it's super important is we often don't want to be that patient who's nagging or, you know, oh gosh, you're one of those Dr. Google patients. Like, but you know that the truth is, you know, your body best. Right. And exactly. sure, we we're part of the unlucky minority where it became something, but you know, you have to vocalize or no one's going to go down that route. Okay. And it's better to, to do that than to be a good patient, whatever that means, and right. find something out later. Um, but I look, I know that, you know, because we're talking about the ovarian, and then there was that focused endometrial cancer group. Um, but as far as those were concerned, you were no evidence of disease, right? And Yeah. Whew. So I'm going on three years at this point. Um, my last checkup was in July, um, and I got the all clear on everything. Um, in regards to that. And so we are on to my next six months. I, I'm at six months at this point. So I went um, th every three months for my first two years in years three through five or until five, I'll go um, every six months. And right. then at the five year mark, I'll go annually. Annually. Yeah. You know, I think I had the same protocol. So, and we went through treatment same time, by the way. So. Oh, we did? And sisters. So no, we're I like on the same schedule. Okay. So my dad was, uh, he's, started chemo I ended it in June and he started it in August uh, I see August or September oh it might have been September actually it was okay yeah I ended in June as well um yeah. but but so we you know you spend so much time with us so before we wrap I really want to be able to get your I mean because I know you do a lot of work I saw you on social media and you really um were talking about ovarian cancer awareness so I guess what's most important to you to get across now the people who are um watching this and reading this most likely are people who've just been diagnosed already, right? Mm -hmm. Patients and caregivers. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess as part of being a former patient and being an advocate, I guess, what are your most important messages to people about all this? Sure. So I would tell anyone that's newly diagnosed to decide yourself what is the best plan for you and how you want to receive information, how you want to lose your hair, how you want treatment to go, who you want to be a part of this. It's all your choice. You don't have to do what everybody else is doing. And, um, and we have those caretakers around us. And although they feel like they are going through it with you, they are not going through it. It isn't happening to them. And that's something that not only you have to remember, but they have to remember. And I don't want to downplay their role at all because I will never be able to repay um, my caretakers um, for all that they gave up in order to make sure that I was okay. Um, it is going to feel like you are going through the worst possible thing ever. But if you can put one foot in front of the other every day, you will get to that finish line, whatever it is, and then you take the next steps. So you have to take one, each step at a time. And once you get a plan in place, things start to seem a whole lot easier because you know what you need to do and you focus on that. For those of you that have just finished up um, your treatment and you are stuck at the edge of the cliff, basically where you feel like your doctors are pushing you off the edge and you're a baby bird and you have no idea how you're supposed to navigate all of this, none of us do. Um, your life is completely different. It's not a bad thing. It takes a while to adjust. Figure out what works for you. It's not going to be the same as it was before. And maybe you don't want for it to be the same as it was before because you're realizing things now that you wouldn't have in the past. And I know that's how it is for me. Um, do I miss the carefree, I call it being naive to all that is cancer? Absolutely, I do. Um, if you read anything on my social media, you'll see from time to time, I'll say my favorite place to have a breakdown is the shower floor because it's, it's quiet and nobody can hear me. And even though I look upbeat and positive all the time, you're still allowed to have your, your, your moments because this wasn't fair and it shouldn't have happened. And 
my body still hurts and I still have to go to these appointments and it's exhausting. I get it. You're going to be able to figure out how this works. I think, don't you think like we're the same amount of time out from treatment out from treatment. I think it just, it just takes a little bit of time to navigate. Absolutely. And, and it's new and it's different. And right. as humans, we don't like new and different. We like <laughs> just the way it was. <laughs> right. No, it's comforting, right? When it's just the same thing over and over again. But I, I couldn't agree more to your points, Randallin. And the survivorship part of it, I think, is hardest right at that, you know, um, point of, like you said, when your doctors are like, okay, little bird, you're free to go. And you're like, well, how, where am I supposed to fly? How do I fly? Um, I think those are the hardest parts because you go yeah. from having all the support, whether it's a medical plan and or all your caregivers are around you to then like, oh, she's done with treatment. Okay, well, cancer is done. And it's not really quite that, right? That was a hard, so I had a lot of pre-warning on, you're not going to go back to, don't expect to go back to things full swing. But I, until I think you have, been diagnosed with cancer and you've gone through chemo, you don't realize it that once the treatment stops, it's not necessarily over. You know, like you still have the, the side effects and stuff and the fatigue and all of the aches and pains for quite some time afterwards. Um, and everybody around you, not everybody, some people around you expect everything to just go back to normal and, and it's just going to be the way it was before. And unfortunately that's, that's not how it works. It's, and like I said, it's not, it's not a bad thing. Right. It's just, yeah. it's just the way it is. And, and I like, you know, it's, it's the, there's PTSD, but there's also the post-traumatic growth, which I know to some people yeah. it's crazy, but I really believe it. I feel like you, you know, you had said, do I miss the naive, you know, before cancer thing? I, I agree. Right. We're like, your health started here, not here, but right. I'm grateful for the perspective that I have now, for sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I, agree more. And I think some people are like, oh, you're just saying that you're just blowing smoke. And I'm like, no, actually I'm not. Like, I think I'm a better person now, or at least a better version of myself yeah. Yeah. because I don't have, you know, or I don't feel like I have the time to say, oh, well, you know, like I have time because right. it's like the chance that you don't have that time happens like you realize okay let's adjust some things and 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 change absolutely for the better, hopefully. exactly no i i still agree and i i hope that we can talk again because i really enjoy yeah. the conversation i will make sure to you know post your your social and your advocacy work um whatever you know you'd like people to know about on your story page so sure. randolyn thank you so much for joining us on the patient story i'm really excited to get your story out there Oh, you're welcome. I'm so glad I was able to join you today.